Good afternoon. It's the 20th of October uh, here in Salem Presbyterian Church. It is um, a beautiful fall day outside, high of about 70 degrees. Went hiking this morning, um, as I do almost every morning, with my dear wife and our dog. And it was like 50 this morning. Uh, just great weather and bright and um, started out in the dark this morning and by the time we got up the mountain the uh, light was coming that beautiful fall light was coming through the trees it was wonderful um, anyway uh, we're I'm Tupper Garden I'm the associate pastor at Salem Presbyterian Church in Salem Virginia which if you're watching this, you probably already know. Um, we've been working our way through the Gospel of John, and last week we finished with John's uh, crucifixion narrative. And we're beginning now with the uh, 20th chapter, that is the very familiar story of the resurrection in John's Gospel. And so we will spend a little time on that today. Let's begin with a prayer. Lord, your blessings we pray on what we do. May your Holy Spirit attend us. Whatever our needs are as we watch this video, we pray that we would be given hope and um, assurance of your love and care and that we would be enabled to follow you more nearly. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. So, it would be my contention that the Gospel of John has a particular axe to grind that is a little different from any other book in the Bible. And I obviously love the Gospel of John, and I love the axe that John grinds. I have, as you are aware, if you've been doing going through this um, study with me, I have more questions than answers about what John has to say. But I find John's view of uh, Christianity, of the faith, the apostolic faith, um, to be intriguing, challenging, glorious beyond measure. Um, John starts it all off with the first chapter, which we always need to keep in mind. Everything in this gospel is predicated on his desire that his reader would understand that there is a God and that this God loves us and that this God wants to reveal, to express himself to us to express his nature and his purpose for all of us. And he has done so through the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who is, according to John, God's word, God's self-expression in the flesh of a man. The word made flesh that dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory. Now, the entire Gospel of John is an expression of the nature and care of, of that principle that Jesus is the expression of God. Now, the great, I think, the great expression of who is God in his character, in his nature, where do we see God in Jesus, where we see him most is in the crucifixion. God is the one who gives himself for us out of love. Jesus, we also see God's intention for humanity. That is that Jesus fulfills the Father's purpose for himself in his obedience to death. Uh, we also see the contrast between God's purposes and the purposes of the powers of this world that uh, mock and eventually murder Jesus. 
even religious people, even perhaps especially religious people, John would want us to understand and would want us to see ourselves and be convicted by that, that this is who we are. Uh, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yes, you and I were there. As a matter of fact, we were part of it in a sense. And we, and so we begin with, as we read that crucifixion narrative, we begin by a sense of our own uh, need for repentance, our own unworthiness to, uh, of such love, of such a savior, of such a God. We begin there. Then after, our, after, we, after our, our unworthiness, then with a sense of uh, wonder, I think that God would come in such a way, how would you expect God to be revealed to you? If you were just coming up with an idea of, you know, if you just conjured in your mind that there is a God and how would that God come to us? How would that God be revealed to us? You and I, I mean, it would be quite original to say that God reveals himself in a man bloodied and crucified on a hill outside of Jerusalem. And yet, that's how God comes in. And so we should be filled with our own unworthiness and we should be filled with a sense of our own unworthiness and a sense of wonder that this is the God with whom we deal not a God that's high and and distant and um, uncaring and unsympathetic and a God that is un is unlimited but a God that chooses to limit himself in this man in, in, in the brokenness of a human being. If we can wrap our heads around that, and it's very hard to, then, uh, then we've really gotten somewhere. And so we begin with humility and confession and we go to wonder. And then maybe we move to pathos, where we, P-A-T-H-O-S, pathos, pathos, the, um, what kind of a God is a God that suffers like that? And what does it mean for us? And, and, and you know, the, the, here's, if you don't hear anything else I say about the crucifixion, we can remember this much. Uh, there is no answer for the question of theodicy. Theodicy is, why is there evil in the world? There are all sorts of books that have been written about it, all sorts. Of, but here is, here is what we know when we experience uh, suffering, evil, um, betrayal, death, when we're confronted with the inhumanity of our world and the seeming um, insensitivity of the universe, when things happen that we can't understand how it can happen if a loving, if there is a loving and all powerful God, how do we justify in our minds a loving God, an all-powerful God, and a world that is unfair in which innocents suffer? Well, we can't. Uh, there are all sorts of mental and theological gymnastics that people go through to reconcile those three things. Powerful God, loving God, 
tragedy, evil, suffering. Um, but the Christian answer, John's answer, John's answer to, to that question of the Odyssey, that question that we're posing right now, is that God is the one who suffers. Uh, so that we, we don't have a cognitive, categorical answer, but we have a personal answer. We have um, um, uh, a divine answer. We have an answer that's greater than anything that we could cogitate, that's greater than some sort of a formula, that what we have is a God who is with us in our suffering that we don't look at, uh, in our suffering and look at our suffering and think that God doesn't care, that God couldn't understand. No, it is God who suffers for us and who suffers with us, and that Jesus, when he died on that cross, bore our sins in his body on that cross, and surely he has borne our griefs, and, and, and surely he has known our suffering. He that God is the one who has come and limited himself in such a way and experienced with us and for us in Christ all that we might ever imagine. And that is the comfort, which is really what we need. You know, we're modern Americans and we think we we need rational um, uh, uh some sort of form, rational formula by which we can explain everything, uh, but but that, that's that's an illusion. What we really need is a is a, is is caring. What we really need is love. What we really need is a um, a, uh, a a God who uh, comes alongside of us in our suffering, who uh, comes alongside of us when injustice. Uh, uh, prevails, who comes alongside of us when the innocents are, are murdered. And it happens every day in this world of ours. And um, we often turn aside just as we turn aside from the cross and the crucifixion. John would have us look at the cross and the crucifixion and see there God revealed, you see. The Word made flesh. God's self-expression made flesh in the pathetic pathos, the pathetic, in the best sense of that word, the pathetic sight of God in Christ crucified on a Friday afternoon outside of Jerusalem. Now, what are we to do with that? We're to say humility, penitence, wonder, pathos, and last thing, challenge. How am I to, what does this say about how I am to live? I am to live in the assurance that this is the God who loves me. I am to live in the assurance that he calls me to follow him in the person of Christ. That, that what we have always said, what the Christian faith has always said, is that Jesus is God revealed and God's intention for humanity revealed. In other words, if I want to know how to live as a Christian, then I look to Jesus and his life as the model of how I ought to live. And by that, I don't mean uh, uh, I do everything just like he did it. You know, we used to have those, remember, how long ago was it? 20 years ago, people wore these wristbands. They had WWJD. What would Jesus do? And it's a great question. And unfortunately, the Bible doesn't really answer that question for us. What would Jesus do? It's a really good question. What does the crucifixion have to do with what Jesus would do in our very different world from the world Jesus lived in? The there, there aren't concrete answers in what Jesus does at the crucifixion. The only concrete answer that we get is Jesus places the will of God before himself and the love of neighbor before himself. 
his love for us, for creation, his love and obedience to the purposes of the Father before his own purposes and is willing to suffer and die in order that that, that, that great desire, primary desire, driving desire, is to do the will and the purpose of the Father, to be an expression of the Father, the, of God's love. So it is to be with us. When we look at, so the great to pathos, uh, I mean, uh, penitence, um, uh, penitence before this, wonder before this, a sense of the pathos of God before this, and the pathos of life, and finally, challenge, a, a, a challenge a, a, to, to an adventure in which we see the purpose of our life. And this is when I start to get excited, as you can tell. It, the, the great challenge of our lives is to be as Jesus was, an expression, the Word made flesh. The church is to be the body of Christ. The church, imperfect as it is, is to be an expression of God in our world. And you and I individually and collectively are to be an expression of the love of God and neighbor, putting God first, neighbor second, loving ourselves, loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, and being increasingly self-forgetful in the service of others and in the service of God. Ha. Huh. Well, uh, that is a lifelong challenge and a lifelong adventure. It, it, it's an adventure because it's a difficult thing to do. And in every moment, in every experience, it is possible for us to live that way. And the kingdom of God is present when we do, and the kingdom of God is not present when we don't. And, and that is the excitement of the spiritual life. The Christian life. Uh, now we move to the next thing. And the next thing is that is the great point of the 20th chapter. It has several points. Uh, but the great point is that it may seem that the love of that the love of God and love of neighbor fails that the love of God and the love of neighbor is defeated, that Jesus' understanding of himself as the Messiah, as the Word made flesh, as, as having this mission, that John's mission as, as recording all of this all comes to naught. It may seem that it's a pipe dream, that's an ideal, that it's something you know, this crazy idea, and we have to admit it may be. But, but the 20th chapter tells us that the love of God is so strong, that the power of God's love is so strong, that the way and the truth and the life of Christ is, that God in Christ is so strong that not even death, not even death can defeat it. It appears as though Jesus and, and, and the, the program that John has is, is laid out for us is, ends in utter defeat. Not so that God vindicates what Jesus has done, that God's love is more powerful than the forces of evil. Do you and I believe that? Well, if we believe in Easter, we believe that. We may not know we do, but we do. If you believe that Christ was raised on the third day, crucified on, on Friday and raised on Sunday, then you believe that, that good is stronger than evil, that the love of God is stronger than the powers of this world. And you can live in that. And it's hard to do. It, when the, I mean, all evidence to the contrary, it may seem, as this great sermon by... Um, used to be the pastor of Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City, uh, James Forbes, I believe was his name, black gentleman. And he, I think I've got this right. I maybe have it wrong, but I think I got it right. And he said, you know, 
we tend to live on Friday afternoon. You know, it's dark. The powers of evil seem to have sway over all things. Human nature, even our human nature, seems to be more powerful than our better nature, what God would have us be and do. That love is often defeated by hatred, that the powers of this world are stronger than the church and that the church itself is so weak because it's made up of people like us that nothing ever changes, nothing ever gets better. Nothing, with it, we live on Friday, uh, but Sunday's coming, Jim Forbes. He had his refrain in this Easter morning sermon. He says, but Sunday's coming. But we're an Easter people, and Sunday's coming, Sunday's coming. It may be Friday, but Sunday's coming. And, and, and that's true for your life and mine. It may, be, it may seem that everything is going south on you, but Sunday's coming. God will prevail, and love will overcome hatred and evil. And that's the fact. That's the fact of Easter. So, early on the third day, while it was still dark, on the first day of the week, that is Sunday, so Sabbath is on Saturday. Saturday is on the Jewish week. Saturday is the seventh day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. By the way, this is why we have worship on Sunday mornings and why we call Sunday the Sabbath, because it is the day of the resurrection. Indeed, we used to say that Sunday was the Lord's day because that we, we, we called Sunday the Lord's day because Sunday was the day that the Lord rose victorious. And so Sunday becomes the Sabbath, the seventh day, the day of rest. You see that? In the, in the Jewish week, Saturday is the day of rest. So they put Jesus' body in the tomb on Friday night before sunset, because Sabbath begins at sunset. Sabbath is sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday. And then on Sunday morning, sometime after the end of the Sabbath, Christ rose. And that's where we pick up the narrative. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, do you see that? While it was still dark. I don't know how many times on Easter morning I have preached on that little phrase, while it was still dark. Too many, those of you who know me, because I find that so captivating that John says, while it was still dark. It is still dark for Mary, and it is still dark for all of us unless we can believe in the resurrection we see God's love on Friday, but it's one thing to see God's love and hope in God's love. It's another thing to believe that God's love will be vindicated. I may say that I intend to be one who loves and that that's a great way to live. But, in the, but this is the truth. In the day-to-day -day of life, self-giving, putting the good of my neighbor before my own, trying to live that way, I will be defeated unless I believe that in the end, unless I trust that in the end, God will vindicate my attempt to live the way, the truth, and the life of Christ. You see? There's, a, there's this, as we used to say in the old Scottish worship book, uh, at the funeral, We'd say the sure and certain, uh, and now we lay old Tupper's body to in the ground in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Sure and certain hope. It is not something that we know. It is something that we trust with a surety and a certainty because it is, it is what God has revealed to us in Christ, right? 
it's 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 it, it doesn't mean that we have it sure and certain like i know that i'm sitting in my at my desk in the my uh the pastor's office at salem presbyterian church it's not sure and certain like i know two plus two is four in a sense though it's more sure and certain than either of those things it's not materialistically rash rationalistically uh, empirically certain, but it's certain on another level. It's certain down here. It's certain in my, in my, in in the depths of my being, because God has made me this way to believe this, that 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 God is love, and that and that God the love of God is stronger than the powers of evil in this world. You see, so it's sure and certain, and so while it was still dark, so for Mary. He is dead, and he and Mary goes to the tomb on Sunday morning while it is still dark. Things to, there is no sure and certain hope for Mary. She does not know the hope of the resurrection, of 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 Christ rising, of the victory of love over death and hell. She doesn't know that. It's dark. And so she goes. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. And what did she see? She saw that the stone had been rolled away, removed from the tomb. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that there's a physical resurrection is what it means. It doesn't mean that it, it means, and this is a hard one for me, and I know it's a hard one for you. That It's a hard one for anybody that thinks about it. It's not that Jesus dies and has a has a new life in the way that we think, well, when old Tupper dies, he'll live on, you know. He'll live on in our memories. He'll live on in our best thoughts. We'll laugh at some of the stupid things that he did. We'll remember him and we'll sit around the family table or the and we'll and we'll tell stories about um about the time that he did this or he did that. He lives on forever, right? That's what that's what we say. He lives on in our memories. He lives on in our consciousness. Yes, Jesus lives on in our memories, and yes, Jesus lives on in our in our in our consciousness. But twentieth chapter of John wants us to know that the stone was rolled away. Why? Because the physical body of Jesus came out. You don't have to roll the stone away if in some spiritual sense only Jesus lives on. You don't have to roll the stone away if, in, if Jesus lives in our memories. You roll the stone away because the guy who's in there wants to get out. And so that's the point of the, of the, of the moved stone. The stone had been removed from the tomb. Now, what... Mary can't imagine, and neither can I. I would be just like Mary. Mary cannot imagine that the stone being moved means that Jesus is resurrected. What Mary thinks is that somebody obviously, obviously has moved the stone and has taken the body. Why would anybody do that? Well, we'll talk about that in, next week. The stone had been removed from the tomb, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. We're assuming this is John, the writer of the Gospel of John. And said to them, they, who is they? Well, one assumes the religious authorities. Uh, Annas and Caiaphas and the temple guards and the Jewish authorities in the uh, uh, in in uh, Jerusalem because they don't want they they have opposed Jesus all along and they don't you know they don't want um, they want to take his body and you know desecrate it or whatever and so Mary says they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. Uh, notice that the uh, pronoun there is we. Uh, 
plural, first person plural, we. Um, in the other Gospels, Mary does not come alone. Maybe John, it would be just like John, to say that she's in the dark alone. Uh, and then to say we, because there really were other women with her, with him, with Mary. We do not know where they have laid him. Of course, she might have seen some people on the way and told them, and they. You know, but the idea is, it's an interesting question. Why does she use the plural pronoun? We do not know where they have laid him. We don't know what they did with his body, what she's saying. And then Peter and the other disciple, that is John, set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And he bent down, looked in, and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, that is John, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples returned to their homes. That's where we will begin next week. Now, finally, finally, what does what's this business about the wrappings and the linen cloth and the so they took these spices and they packed them on the body and then they rolled Jesus in 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 a shroud and wrapped his head all around. That was in order to preserve the body so that it wouldn't smell. And the linen wrappings means that the Lord, this is what this is kind of evidence, you see, that the Lord somehow came through these wrappings, his resurrected body and the wrappings over his head and over his body he either took them off of himself or someone took them off of him or he came directly through them the shroud of turin uh of which we you know it's a kind of interesting thing uh this what it's a shroud that they believe was the shroud that some people believe is the shroud that Jesus was wrapped in. It has this impression on it of a body. And the idea that people, the speculation is that Jesus rose through the linens and as he did, that he left an impression, the energy left an impression on him, like a, like a photocopy kind of. Um, who knows? But it's in keeping with John's gospel. And what John wants us to know yet again is that Jesus, that the Jesus who was dead is the Jesus who rose. The Jesus who was wrapped, his body and his head, is the Jesus who came out of there. Okay? And that's the point that the resurrection is real and not imagined and not about a ghost, okay? Um, may the Lord bless you and keep you and may his resurrected presence attend you. Bye-bye.